One. I remember this super vividly. Lots of tears were shed this day as my family had lost our matriarch, my great-grandmother of 104. The family was torn to shreds last weekend. Weekend of the 8th of November, 2019. So nonsense like this wasn't expected. A bit of backstory. My dad's family is full of many different ethnic groups. My aunts and uncles live all over the world, so they married accordingly. However, this EM and EK, about in their mid-40s and late-10s respectively, figured their emotions were more important than my own. I've always been close to my grandparents on my dad's side, and that hasn't changed, even when my mom, 52, and dad, 61, divorced, and I moved to Texas. Setting of the story is in my hometown of Wichita, Kansas. We've gone through a ton of losses since I was little. My great-grandmother as of late, her daughter, my dad's mother, back in February 8th of 2017, and my gramps, who I wasn't old enough to remember. I've had my share of funerals, and if it wasn't seen as disrespectful, I would much rather mourn in secret. Yet, every funeral I've gone to, my father has always saved me a seat in the front pews near him, so that I'm not lost in the sea that is my dad's side of the family. Mostly also, since I usually call myself being a soldier, when he finally breaks down it helps that I'm there to comfort him. Last funeral, his mom's, was the worst of these. He didn't even want to go back to his resident state, Tennessee, but instead wanted to live in their old house with his little sister, my aunt, for the rest of his days, because that's where she last was. Needless to say, knowing his parents and now grandparents were both gone, he was sputtering and bawling and just would not stop. That's jumping a bit too far, so let's take it back to when everyone was filing into the chapel. I naturally took my spot next to my father in the first row of pews, preparing for tons of tears. I was taking a moment to myself to breathe, calming myself down. I was getting anxious and was about to have an anxiety attack. When EM, EK, and begrudgingly ND, nice dad, one of my married-in uncles, walk up to me, I stand to give them a hug and some blessings as normal, then go to sit down. Suddenly, though, EM grabs my arm and holds me in suspension. Her nails are cutting into me a bit, but I don't say very much about it. I was an adventurous kid, a few scrapes and bruises never hurt, so her cat claws for damn sure weren't going to do a thing. Excuse me? Where do you think you're going? Indirect family sits toward the back. I was appalled. Multiple scenarios of me hanging out at my great-grandmother's. From now on is Big Granny house and playing with Legos until my dad came home from work, filling my mind. I clear my throat. This was helping none with my anxiety attack, by the way. Sorry, I don't think I understand. I'm Big Granny's first generation of great-grandbabies. This is my seat, same as my dad. Her grandbaby has reserved this seat. <laughs> I don't see your name on it, kid. Move out of the way. Don't you know to respect your elders? Acting like this doesn't make you any more of an elder as it makes me. You don't see me telling Big Granny's great-great-great-grandchildren not to chew gum or play on their mom and dad's phones instead, do you? She seems baffled by my talking back, but she's trying her best not to raise her voice. I've known Big Granny for years. You're never around. There's no way a slut spawn like you was a reserved seat here. I doubt she even remembered you. I'm nearly to tears by this point. Not only did she insult me, but she tried to tack on some guilt to make me feel even worse for having to live with my mother under custody. My mom didn't even want me to come to the funeral. I look over and they're carrying Big Granny in, preparing to start. I begin to whisper, fighting the tears of confrontation as well as seeing Big Granny's coffin. I'm sure that Granny wouldn't want someone calling her great-grandchild a slut spawn. It's time to be respectful. E.K. butts in, trying to put in her own two cents. She's right, you know, Big Granny loved me more because I was around. We deserve to see her first. Now move, jerk. Hush up, stay out of grown folks' conversation. She turns back to me. E.M. in classic black mom fashion gives the back of her head a small smack. Hush up, stay out of grown folks' conversation. She turns back to me. But she's right, we've been around more, so these are our seats. Move it. My dad, turning from his wife to tune in, stands up, his light-skinned face turning beet red in anger. He looked as if he were going to pop his eyeballs out. Andy, take your wife to the back. Big Granny is here. There's no time to be disrespectful. 
Excuse me, I have as much right to be here with E.K. to honor our great-grandmother as much as she did. My dad was having none of it. Get. Out. What? Leave the chapel. Go away. You're bringing negative energy to a serious situation. Leave. Now. His outburst brought a ton of attention. I was nearly to tears, and it wasn't even because they had opened her casket for viewing. EM, EK, and ND start to walk out. EM and EK are beat red and bawling. I grab ND and shake my head. You deserve to see her. You weren't a part of this. That's nice. I've been trying to turn her out for a while now. Words said to be cordial and all. My dad smiled knowingly. You better hope you get EK to train her right. It seems her mother isn't there for her. Rather just to flaunt relevance over everyone else. It's not the way to go. Come, sit. Let's get over, Calypso Eclipso. I oblige and everything goes as normal. The funeral service was amazing. It wasn't depressing. The pastor made some nice points, some good laughs, and brought back some really fond memories. One thing from the funeral I was told to repeat for anything in the future. Let not your heart be troubled. Thanks for listening. Sunrise, December 18th, 1915. Sunset, November 2nd, 2019. Gone but never forgotten, she watched the world change before her eyes and brought up a family worthy of continuing her legacy. May she rest in peace, reunited with her family now past. Say hello to Gramps, Little Granny, Grammy, and Papa, Unc L, and Mrs. Johnson for me. We miss you all. Two. So, to start things off, an arcade in England is like a casino for under-18s. I don't know if Americans have arcades, never been there. There are lots of little fun games which are sure to lose you money but cost small amounts. The machine in question in this story is a 10p dropper. If you've ever seen the show Tipping Point, it is that, but with 10ps instead of counters. There are also prizes that can be dropped, such as £1 coins and 5 to £10 notes, mystery boxes, sweets, etc. Also worth mentioning that I was with my younger brother, B. So I was walking around the arcade and saw the machine mentioned above, and it had a £10 note right on the edge that was being pinned down by a mystery box that also looked like it was about to fall off. It is really hard to find something like that because most of the time someone will get it before you or the employees will move it. So I get to playing right away to try to win this, while B goes to get more money. It is worth mentioning that it was about 8.30 and the arcade was quite full. It only took me around £2 before I got the box to fall, which pulled the £10 note. You can imagine how excited I was at this point. I just actually made money from an arcade which is unheard of. Now, when a prize falls out, the machine plays a little song and I never knew this, but the song attracts EMs and their irritating EKs. So over comes EM pushing a stroller with a child who looked too old for it, and a 9 or 10 year old. Hey, this was my machine. I just went to get money for it. Sorry, it's not like you can save machines when no one is there. Yes I can. Now give me your prizes, they're mine. And I would have gotten them if you weren't here. She tried to grab the note out of my hand. B comes back with more 10 Ps. Hey, guard, you won it. No, he stole it off me, and now he's going to give it back. She reaches for the note and knocks the prize box out of my hand, which falls open. B picks it up. Oh, this box has a 5,000 ticket voucher in it. For reference, one ticket equals 0.1p. So pretty worthless on their own, but 5,000 of them, that makes 50 pounds. And that was the jackpot. Mummy, I want the tickets. Don't worry, you'll get them. She full on lunges at me, banging into the machine which sets off the alarm. By now people were watching and security, yes, they have security, were walking over. EM is literally on me, trying to reach my hand. She quickly turns around and says, Thank goodness you're here, this person just stole my prize off of me. Okay, what happened? I just let the following bit happen, because I had proof and knew there was no point in trying to cut off an EM. I was playing here with my son, and then when the prize fell out, Gowage ran in and grabbed the prize and tried to run. Where I grabbed him and set off the alarm to get your attention. He tried to run again, which is why I pushed him onto the machine. Isn't this what happened, DK? Yes, 
The money's mine and the tickets. Now the people that were standing by started speaking up. Uh, no, she tried to take it off him. And other such phrases defending me. So uh, what actually happened? Well, I would explain it, but I'm sure that camera, I point to the camera that was directly above the machine, all the machines have this to stop cheating and theft, will show it all. Okay, let's go. EM's getting anxious now. No, come on, surely we can just split the money and EK can have the tickets. I need to get my baby to bed. Baby is like three or four. <laughs> he was now whining because the alarm woke him up. It's well past his bedtime. At 8.40... Sorry, I don't need proof to do anything. Well, I would explain how the rest of this went, but you can probably guess. I had to give the prizes to S. I walked outside the security room with a very grouchy EM and shouted EK, where the guard reviewed the footage. Bearing in mind that we weren't allowed in the room, came out and said this. Well, before I can say anything, I need to see your passes. We had these passes that let us go into the arcade. I pull out my pass from my wallet. Here. S then scans it, gives me back the pass, the money, and the ticket. There you go, all yours. Turns to EM, and your pass please, I need to take it from you. You are no longer allowed in here. EM pretends to look through pockets. Sorry, I must have left them in my car. How did you get in here then? Uh... Okay, what is your name, so I can see if you even have a card. It's Karen. Not really. So you aren't even on the system. From now on, EM just pleads that she had it and had done nothing wrong. As checks cameras again when EM says that I stole her machine which she saved. S then says that you can't save machines and that she was also in the bar since 7.30 and had gone nowhere near the machine. EM gets kicked out of the site and is no longer allowed in. Thanks for sticking to the end. 3. I was a photo associate, so I had to handle the photo center by electronics and the shoe department. It was an easy job, make the photo orders, clean the machines, and assist customers with their orders. And by far, this was one of the worst I dealt with. It was near the evening and business was slowing down when I saw a couple, entitled Mom, EM, and Nice Dad, and D, come up to the counter along with two children. They don't really play a part in the story. I greeted them and asked how I could help them. You want to make a poster for my son's funeral? Possibly 23 by 36. I'm sorry for your loss, but I can help make the order. Thank you. As I helped them with the order, ND told me that their eldest son died from an ATV accident. A trick gone wrong. And he died his first night in the hospital. And they wanted to have a poster of him at a young age with his first dirt bike. I told them it would take possibly half an hour for the order to finish and say they can look around Walmart if they wanted to, and would call them on the overhead when it's done. And they did. But as soon as the order was halfway done, the poster machine went haywire. They had it long before I was hired, and it broke down a lot. Why they didn't replace it, I had no idea. So I called them on the overhead to come back to the photo center, and he comes back, but EM and her kids were nowhere to be found. I told ND that the poster machine broke halfway through and their order wouldn't be ready for a few days. ND was understanding, saying that the funeral was just a week away, so they have time. I offered to see if a different Walmart would print their order, but he said it was okay. You will give me a call when it's up and running? Absolutely. We will have your phone number in our system and give you a call when we have it running and your order complete. ND thanked me for my help and walked away. It was not only a few minutes later as I was calling maintenance to look at the poster machine the next day. I could slowly feel something coming as I heard someone slamming their hands on the counter. It was EM with ND and her kids in tow. I need to have a word with you. Luckily I was done calling maintenance and come up to the counter. Yes ma'am, how can I help? Why is the poster not ready? You said it would be ready today. I'm sorry, ma'am. I explained to your ND that our poster machine broke down and the order won't be ready for a few days. That is bullshit. It was working just fine. Get it running again. Ma'am, I can't make it run. I'm having maintenance come to look at it tomorrow. No, we need it now. The funeral is tomorrow and we need it. Honey, the funeral is a week away. No, she's just refusing to do her job. She kept yelling at me for about five minutes, me and ND trying to calm her down, while their kids were crying because of the argument. Luckily, my manager came over to hear the yelling. Is there a problem here? 
Yes, your employee is refusing to help us. We need a poster and she's denying us our order. I informed them that the poster machine broke down again. And I'm having maintenance look at it the next day, since it was near the photo center's closing time when I called. I'm sorry, ma'am, but there's nothing we can do. But I need that poster now. Ma'am, if you like, I can call another Walmart near us to see if they can- No! You just don't want to do your job. That's it. My eldest son won't rest in peace now. This entire funeral is ruined because of you. My son won't rest peacefully because of you. You've ruined this for my family. She pointed this at me while yelling at me. Everyone around her was appalled by the accusation. I was even shocked as well, and nearly broke down right there and then. She kept yelling at me directly until M had enough. Ma'am, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. I am not. You are not only causing a scene right now, but accuse my associate of something that couldn't be avoided. Either you leave now, or I'm calling security to escort you out. Yem half at us and left, but not without calling us effing lazy associates, Andy and her kids walking behind her. As soon as she left, I just broke down because she blamed a funeral on me. Em was hugging me and told me it was okay and it wasn't my fault. He allowed me to have an extra break so that I could calm down and recollect myself. And it was nearly an hour until it was time for me to clock off, so I stayed over at electronics until it was time for me to go home. And a few days later, I was cleaning the machines as the poster machine worked again. This time, M talked to the main manager at our Walmart to order a new poster machine. And I heard someone at the counter. It was ND. Oh, hi, I came for the poster. I nodded and grabbed the poster and made the sale. Listen, I want to apologize for my wife the other day. It's all right, she was grieving, I understand. Yeah, but she had no right to blame that on you. Sir, it's okay. I get this stuff a lot sometimes here in photo. Wouldn't be the only time. He thanked me and left with the poster. I haven't seen them since then. I worked there for a few years until I got a different job. I told my dad of this. He's an RN. And he told me that she was on the second stage of depression and just took her anger out on me. It didn't feel like it, but it is what it is. Four. Me, if you are a big brain, I'm sure you know this one. NK, the nice kid, bullying quasi-noob, probably like eight or nine. EM, this story would never be complete without this MF. DSM, desk staff member, a great friend of mine. So I recently got into bowling and wouldn't you know, I love it a lot. I recently changed my ball from a Roto Grip Hustle Inc. to a brand new Brunswick Quantum Bias Pearl. Ran me $210, that's $150 for the ball, $50 for getting the finger holes drilled. With pro balls, you need the holes drilled for your precise hand size. They aren't pre-drilled, and $10 for inserts, rubber grips. It's a Saturday night, and I'm with my three friends whose names will not be revealed due to privacy reasons. This bowling alley is in my hometown, Lawrence, Kansas. In comes the Karen, and her kid, who couldn't be older than, I don't know, eight maybe? I brush it off, saying no big deal, but a big fucking shock. They get the lane next to me. We're on the first game, eighth frame, and I've got a 1-6-1. At this, I notice the kid has gone up to our ball return and was trying to lift up my bowling ball and struggling to do so. Cue dialogue. Hey there, kid. Why are you touching my ball? Well, you're doing good. I saw your score, so I thought using your ball would help me do well. Uh, I should have asked. I'm sorry. Well, I would let you use it, but it's brand new, and you probably can't even carry it. It's 14 pounds. Plus, the holes are drilled to fit my hand, so it won't work for you. Okay. Sorry for interrupting, sir. It's okay. Have a good one. He hustles back to his lane, so I continue on. Ninth frame and a 110 split has veered its head onto my lane. I have to pick it up to break 170. I grab the ball, and I hear the EM from behind me say... Hey, sorry to interrupt, but can my son use your ball? Hmm? Oh, that. Well, he could if he could carry it, and if it would fit his hand. Plus, it's brand new. This ran me over $200. I mean, it wouldn't kill it to let him try. He already did, though. He can't use it. He is literally physically unable to use it. The ball is too heavy. Wait, did you just say that my son is weak? My friends look on in stifled laughter. No, what makes you think that? I never said that. I am saying that it's just too heavy, 14 pounds. Well, then I'll just have to take it to him to make it easier. Don't do that, miss, please. I get the ball from the return rack before she can get it. What the hell are you doing? 
You were about to take my bowling ball from me, that's what. The DSM enters our lane. What's happening here? Hey, DSM, how are you? This man just tried to take my kid's bowling ball. Ah, Karens. Anyway, that's my ball. She tried to take it from me after her kid saw I was doing well. Yeah, I've seen him come in with this before. This is his. And given that it's on his ball return, I find it really hard to believe. That's not true. I demand this man be removed from this lane. I'm 15 years old, lady. Don't call me a man. You don't look a day under 23. I'll go check the security footage. At this, I see EM's ears go bright red as I say, You really shouldn't have done that. And my friends burst out laughing. NK looks at me with a dumbfounded look and shrugs. The DSM comes back after two minutes. Well, from what I saw, your kid did try to take his ball, but he apologized, so he did nothing serious. But you tried to do it as well, so I'm gonna have to ask that you leave. As the EM and her kid pack up, she says, You steady douchebags can go back to playing your games. Listen here, lady, I was born in Colorado County, and I will die Kansas country. Obviously, you're not country because you're literally carrying around a damn hydro flask with an iPhone X and pop socket. You disrespectful fuck, you need to learn to respect your elders or someday the world will hand your ass to you. Was that a threat? Because DSM can easily forward your statements and security footage to the police. Now get out, you entitled, disrespectful excuse for a mother. EM goes silent, and she and her kid leave. The kid apologized and told me he's tired of his mom being like this all the time. The night was rather uneventful after that. And yes, I did pick up the 110 split. Got a 180. New high score. New high score, baby. 5. So, I'm still baffled by this whole thing. Luckily, this was not directed at me. I just happened to be in line as it went on. I did get tagged in at one point, but very briefly. Just for background, as I know not all countries have this, Canada Post charges custom and duty taxes on some items sent in from other countries. I don't know if the dollar amount has changed in the last while, but it used to be that any merchandise, valued over $25, would be subject to duty taxes, and anything sent as a gift over $60 would be subject to duty tax. I could be wrong on that, but whatever. The actual dollar amounts don't matter. What matters is that EM ahead of me in line at Canada Post this morning, a retail location, not the actual post office itself, didn't like that she was going to have to pay duty tax on something that she bought as a gift. The following is the conversation, as I best remember it, Obviously, it's not verbatim, but I'll do my best not to upplay the insanity. I have your parcel here. There's a customs charge of 18. Something in change I didn't catch that you'll need to take care of. Customs charges? There shouldn't be customs charges on that. It's a gift. The clerk looks at the parcel to read the customs declaration. Sorry, ma'am. It's marked as merchandise on the customs tag, and the return address says it's company. I didn't hear it. You have to pay customs for it. It's merchandise. I know. I bought it myself. It's a gift. I bought it for my son. It's a gift for his birthday. The clerk pauses here as she realizes what's going on. Ma'am, I understand what you're saying. But in order for your item to be considered as a gift, it has to be marked as one and is a gift for the recipient. You can't buy merchandise to be exempt from the customs charges on it because you intend to give the item as a gift. Bullshit, I read everything. It said clearly that what I bought would be under the limit if it was a gift. It's a gift. I'm not paying the customs on it. At this point, EM turned around to me and rolled her eyes, like we were in this together. I, in turn, looked away from her and cleared my throat. We are not in this together. I am sorry if you misunderstood the information online. You can certainly call Karen the Post directly and tell them their information is unclear. But this item is marked as merchandise. You will have to pay the charges for it. I'm not paying it. This is a scam or something. I never did trust the idea of picking up parcels at the drugstore. Our retail post office is in a shopper's drug mart. You obviously don't know and didn't get the right training for this. You're just a drugstore cashier. I understand you feel that way, ma'am. But I don't make the decisions on customs charges. 
The parcels come here marked from Canada Customs when they're processed at the Canadian border. I'm just following their instructions on the parcel. I'm not paying it. All right, that's fine. She turns here to go put the parcel on the counter behind her. What are you doing? I'm going to reshelve your parcel as you don't want it. We'll return to sender saying you refused the parcel. No, I want the parcel. But you just said... I'm not going to pay the customs, but I am taking the parcel. I'm sorry, ma'am. I can't let you do that. You are legally obligated to pay the customs fee if you want the parcel. Those aren't my rules. Those are Canada Customs rules. If you have a problem with that, you need to take it up with them. <sighs> can you believe this? She won't give me the parcel. Actually, I can. Customs sucks, but it's not her fault. Give me the parcel. It's for my son's birthday. Are you really not going to let me have a gift for my son? He's six. How can I explain that to him? If you pay the customs fee, you can take the parcel. Otherwise, it will be considered refused and will be returned to the company. I know this is a scam. I'm not paying for it. She takes out her cell phone at this point, still at the counter, and starts doing something on it. The clerk lets her stand there for a few moments, and then politely asks her to step to the side so she can help the next person in line. Yem glares at her, looks at her phone, and types in a number, and then holds her phone up to the clerk's face. I'm calling Canada Post. We'll see about those charges. Okay, it's a good idea. I'm glad you're taking the initiative. That made me laugh. She said it was so deadpan it was so funny. I got my parcel, no customs for me. I almost wished I did have to pay some just to do it in front of the EM, and was on my way. I kind of wanted to stick around to see what was going to happen next, when Canada Post reinforced this scam. But I had no reason to loiter, so I left. I will wonder forever if she paid that fee. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to The Impractical Proudness of Parents. I pop. Number 25. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. <sighs> well, while I was waiting on some emails coming for these stories, uh, I went ahead and I thought I'll calculate my what my my uh, tax as you know my my revenue my earnings uh, like a good boy and I actually ended up just filling out the tax return. Uh, I won't be sitting down for a while after doing that. When I saw the final amount, it was actually more or less what I was expecting. Um, but still, ouch. Uh, so it'll be a few days and uh, then I'll pay it. Well, I've got a couple of months to pay with them. With the thing, it's those payments on account that get you. It's, eh. Anyway, that's it done now, and I'll like I say I'll pay it in a few days. I mean, it takes me a few days to process it, so I'll wait till that's done. Then cause the thing is, when you, when you see that number initially, it doesn't factor in the payments on account, which is basically if you've never done anything, if you've never done a tax return before, payment on account is when you essentially they calculate you fill in your tax, you do it the first time then they calculate based on that what they think the next year's tax bill is going to be and they make you pay it in advance. They split it between two payments, one due by January 31st, the other due by July 31st. So you basically pay your thing in advance, then when you actually go to do your taxes, if you owe them anything, they'll then you'll pay what they call a balancing payment and uh, if they owe you anything, you can claim it back. Uh, generally, if they do owe me anything, I just kind of leave it on account, and it's you know less to pay when the actual uh, when I do my tax for the next uh, the next required year. Well, I'm sure that's very interesting to all of you, but I think I'm going to wrap things up there. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.